Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm Mary Dillon and this is my first official program as the chair of the Economic Club of Chicago. So I am just thrilled to be here and so, so pleased to welcome our guest speaker today, Reed Hoffman. As most of you know, Reed is LinkedIn's co-founder, a leading Silicon Valley investor, best-selling author, and prolific podcaster. And today's conversation will be moderated by CNBC's John Fort, a reporter that's been following Reed's career for most of his own career as well. So first, I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator, John Fort. John is the co-anchor of CNBC's daily bi-coastal program, Tech Check. It's one of my favorite shows. I love it. Um, many of you also might know John from his work on CNBC's Squawk Alley or from his digital program, Fort Knox, where he interviews founders, CEOs, and innovators. And John's also the creator of the online course, The Black Experience in America. So welcome, John, and thank you so much for, for joining us today. And it's also now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Reed Hoffman. So Reed once famously said that entrepreneurship is like throwing yourself off a cliff and assembling an airplane on the way down, which I think if anybody can uh, pull that off, it's probably Reed. Uh, he's the LinkedIn co-founder. He's a founding PayPal board member, Airbnb investor, current partner of a VC firm called Greylock Partners, which focuses not surprisingly on early stage investments. Plus, Reed is the co-lead director of Reinvest Technology Partners, a VC firm focused on newly public companies. He's also the first to remind us that his first company, a little social networking startup called SocialNet, might have been a little bit ahead of its time, just by seven or eight years. Anyways, Reed, as you probably all know, is a Stanford and Oxford alum. He's the author of several fantastic books, including Blitzscaling, The Lightning Path Fast to Building Massively Valuable Companies, and host of the popular Masters of Scale podcast. He also serves on many corporate boards, including Microsoft, and of course is very active with many nonprofits. So thank you both for joining it to, uh, for joining us today. And John, I'll pass the baton over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll get right to it, Reed. It's good to see you. Um, you know, sorry that we can't all be together in person, but we can be together this way. And, you know, starting off, I just wonder your take on where we are economically uh, right now at this stage of the pandemic. A lot of people were trying to say coming out of the pandemic, uh, you know, until a, a month or so ago, but we're still very much in it. It's had a huge impact, it seems to me, on software, particularly because we've had to rely on it for flexibility while, you know, creating all kinds of bottlenecks when it comes to hardware and physical goods. What, what has it done from your perspective? Well, I mean, I think in many ways, the pandemic is creating on a lot of different levels, a tale of two worlds. Um, you know, it's a tale of, of, of worlds where it's very easy to uh, adjust to uh, working remotely distributed, uh, the acceleration that technology uh, brings. Um, obviously folks who have, um, you know, kind of more of a personal margin uh, in their bank accounts and are, are less dependent. Um, all of that, and then by the way, that also plays out in the world, uh, you know, a wealthy, uh, countries and non-wealthy countries, uh, access to vaccines, et cetera. But also, of course, within our country itself and within folks who are like dependent upon the retail sector or uh, how that uh, has been functioning. And so I think we've we've been in a very much of a tale of two worlds. I think on the positive side, obviously, the, the digital acceleration, the fact that um, we are now kind of innovating in telemedicine and teleeducation and and bringing you know like how to do events like this and actually make these more available and and more broadly um, uh, you know participatory you know kind of really great. On the other hand, I think that they we need to not forget about the fact that there's you know tremendous swaths of the country and the world that are uh, going to uh, spend you know unfortunately probably years working out of the pain and difficulty and that we need to be making sure that we accelerate that, we help uh, provide more of a safety net. And so I think it's it's this kind of weird, you know, kind of tale of two worlds um, that is kind of the yeah. economic reality. It, it seems like it's accelerated the advantages of, of those who have advantages and, and perhaps uh, also accelerated the gap for those who don't have advantages. And it seems to have done something to supply chains and logistics as well. Like we've become aware of not just the convenience of e-commerce, 
but sort of like the fallback stopgap necessity of having multiple ways of getting goods to people, people to places, et cetera. And there's been some rethinking around uh, domestic manufacturing and the importance of that too. How, mm -hmm. how are you seeing that play out uh, even from an investment perspective? Well, one of the things that I think has been a uh, high focus in the last um, you know, five years within Silicon Valley is artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm on the board of OpenAI. Um, a bunch of the large tech companies are building this. And actually, in fact, I think this creates a lot of possible good for the entire country. Because if you'd like a resurgence of manufacturing robotics, of which we've also seen a lot of startups, is the right way to bring that out uh, back. Now, people naturally say, oh, is the entire factory going to be robotic? So no, actually, in fact, as you automate factories, there's a lot more human jobs in them as well. Sure, there's increased productivity. The number of things manufactured per person working there goes up. That's part of what you're you know, creating prosperity and wealth. But to, to make the robots work, you actually, humans are the most flexible and the most like, oh, well, uh, you know, here's how we can design this working environment in kind of a really good way. And so I actually think we should see an intense return to manufacturing. We should use the kind of technological advantages that we have that we're kind of leading in the world in order to make happen. I do think there's some other areas that are gonna be really key. Like I think actually, in fact, semiconductors, we've seen what a shortage means for things as, as broadly, you know, where people wouldn't expect it, like the auto industry and everything else. And I actually think returning to some set of, of kind of places where we also have a, a strong manufacturing basis there, uh, is I think going to be really key, um, but this is actually part of what I think is where you say, okay, well, what's what should be our uh, the engagement of the tech industry, both at the large scale tech companies and also at startups, and the answer is, well, we should be actually doing things to try to help industries across the country, um, not just the traditional like you know kind of software, kind of communications, productivity, right. uh, other kinds of things, but also other uh, areas as well, and I think that's one of the things that I think. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful for. Some of where I'm going with that talk about supply chain and manufacturing and where you were going with chips in the auto industry is we're talking about some stuff where the Midwest, you know, uh, has some advantages and some legacy, especially. How does a, a region like the Midwest position itself uh, during this time with more focus mm -hmm. on manufacturing, more mm -hmm. focus on supply chains. I mean, we see some of what Silicon Valley is doing. You know, Pat Gelsinger at Intel is leaning hard into fabs, even though Intel has been weak there, trying to get some government dollars and assistance flowing in that direction too. What should the Midwest, should, you know, even individual uh, companies, manufacturing players be doing there to make the most of this moment where people are realizing that we need more of what they do? So um, generally speaking, one of the things that I give as kind of a piece of advice is if you are an organization of 20 people or more, you should have a tech strategy. A tech strategy is not an IT strategy. It's not do you use Windows or Mac or iOS or Android or any of those. It's actually, in fact, you know, kind of where, where is tech accelerating your industry? Where, do you, uh, where, do you, where is it going and how do you go there? And I think the same thing is true, um, you know, for these kind of traditional, um, you know, kind of um, Midwest uh, industries. But, you know, Chicago is great. It has a bunch of th things going on. It wasn't just, you know, kind of um, some global powerhouses um, like Groupon, but, uh, you know, one of the, the 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 former key executives at LinkedIn is the CEO of Relativity, Mike Gamson. Uh, there's a bunch of different tech being uh, invented and manufactured there um, across a set of different uh, industries, um, which I think is really great. Uh, and I think that notion of saying, look, we have this strength in these industries. How do we use technology to accelerate? How do we use technology to create the kind of global world leading industries is I think the kind of thing to do. And then you can use the you know, uh, traditional industry expertise around logistics or other kinds of things, or you know, transport as a way of saying, well, we're, we're bringing, our knowledge here and the tech in, and we're making that happen. And I think that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, the, um, actually I think uh, maybe Chicago thinks of itself as the Midwest, but I've been recently told that many of the countries that, or sorry, uh, states that uh, Californians think of the Midwest, think of themselves as the West and California is the far West, but whatever that is, that industrial belt is I think extremely important um, for the US and actually for the world. Um, I, I think about, uh, logistics 
today in particular because Amazon's opening up its northern Kentucky facility, that uh, sort of airfield that's going to be important to transporting, you know, prime goods all over. And, you know, the first Amazon story I ever wrote um, back in 1999, I think it was, out of Campbellsville, was one of their first warehouses there. And, you know, I started learning about the geographic importance of the Midwest. Is there enough innovation mm -hmm. actually coming out of the Midwest itself when it comes to logistics, software, data, uh, innovation, and this logistics that's important to the entire country? Is there potential there to, to really build um, through the university system, through perhaps local investors, even more into that? Uh, absolutely. So, um, like, for example, there's uh, great universities there. Um, uh, Urbana-Champaign, actually, in fact, is one of the ones that actually had a lot of the kind of powering uh, kind of Unix and software and, you know, Mosaic browser way back in the day uh, in terms of in terms of the, um, the, the creation of interesting things. Look, we always need more innovation. Um, no one should ever say, hey, we have enough, um, especially kind of in the generally tech accelerating future. Um, but I think there is a lot of a lot of uh, talent, um, um, entrepreneurialness, uh, raw uh, capabilities that I think are important to harness. Now, that being said, I think it's also important to accelerate. It's one of the reasons why I do uh, things like writing books, which, you know, in some sense seems a little very retro. It's like, OK, you're talking about the future and everything else and you're going back to writing this, you know, uh, you know, the the 17th and 18th century technology kind of books and so forth, or doing podcasts, other things, because that uh, entrepreneurship is how we're going to create a lot of the products and services of the future. It's also going to be how we uh, get to scale in these things. And, you know, look, there is a great entrepreneurial history uh, in Chicago and many uh, uh, places there. I think the 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 answer is to say we you know we can do it and to 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 dedicate yourselves to doing it and then uh, the rest of us um, you know participate help etc as 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 part of that. Yeah, there are a lot of things that I love about Chicago. I've got extended family there. One of the things I hate about Chicago is getting to and from the airport. Uh, Joby is a company that you have invested in. I believe you're in the board of. It just started, uh, you know, officially trading today, and it's kind of that flying car dream in a way. Um, you know, kind of a helicopter taxi in a way. Um, tell me about the impact of technology, the potential impact on cities. What you hope to see for a place like Chicago uh, coming through Joby. Well, one of the funny things about this is, um, uh, you know, my friend Peter Thiel was like, oh, you know, we have tech stagnation because we were promised flying cars. We've got 140 characters in Twitter. Well, here, here, here we're coming with flying cars. You know, Joby, uh, uh, Tesla meets Uber of the air. And what this can mean for cities is redefinition of commutes, a redefinition of space about where you live uh, and how you get to work or to other places or to uh, frequently airports. Um, which are these hubs, but then have a whole bunch of congestion around them. Uh, Chicago, New York, other cities is a way of doing this. And Joby will say, all right, now um, in a uh, kind of a, a giving a sharing business model in an affordable uh, kind of way, we can redefine our transport grid from going from 2D to 3D. And that redefinition will enable uh, kind of like uh, people to to spend less time, you know, uh, idling and commute, uh, less commu uh, pollution uh, coming from that, uh, more ability to uh, change what your kind of space and community is, and do this within the kind of the whole kind of electrification of 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 kind of uh, attacking the kind of the climate change issues, and um, you know, Joby has. Uh, already had a vehicle that's flown uh, 100, 150 miles um, in terms of, of of the reality of it, of actually making, you know, not just a, a science fiction thing, but a, 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 a real flying and has been in process uh, for years uh, with the FAA on the certification process. And, um, you know, and has uh, had over a thousand test flights. So it's, you, you can see it coming. It's what we, I, I frequently think of in on the entrepreneurial process as line of sight. Uh, to uh, mm -hmm. now having flying cars. Um, so talking about cities, flying cars, I want to go into regions and innovation. Mm -hmm. 
right? For, for years now, I've been hearing about how everybody wants to be the next Silicon Valley. And everybody used to have like a, a Silicon name, you know, people were trying to call New York Silicon Alley, they're not doing that anymore. And a lot of that died off, but I've seen, you know, the Seattle region has had real success here, bolstered, of course, by the success of Microsoft and Amazon, but a, a lot beyond that in cloud and data. And then Austin, of course, has done so well. North Carolina Research Triangle uh, continues to have a moment. But what is it about those areas? And those to me seem like the, the best examples in the U.S. of this kind of success. What have they done right uh, that other regions haven't? What can Chicago learn from them and lean into? Uh, so there's a great book uh, by Annalise Sexinian uh, called Regional Advantage, which is everything in it is accurate. Uh, it was kind of like, how did Silicon Valley kind of outpace uh, Boston, where you could nominally say that venture capital was invented uh, with uh, American research and development and George Dorio, or even earlier, potentially uh, elements of the whaling industry. And there's a whole stack of uh, things there, uh, having an open network, uh, being uh, immigration, allowing talent to flow to various places. So like, for example, the the, the non-enforceability of, 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 of non-competes in Silicon Valley isn't a big company to big company thing. It's a question of a small group spinning out from a big company and doing something and not having the big company uh, able to you know, squash it by its larger size and allow that kind of pattern of innovation. And all of those things I think are super important, but the most fundamental is, you know, kind of call it 50 to 90% of the entrepreneurs who recognize that, you know, the, you know, the kind of classic thing I talk about entrepreneurship is you're jumping off a cliff and assembling an airplane on the way down. Um, that that jump is, 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 is scary and is all involving and everything else. And so, so a lot of entrepreneurs will move to where they will be most successful. Where is the ability to make that business successful? There's talent and capital and customers and infrastructure. And part of that is also like, is the, can I bring other talent in? Can I make that happen? And so that aggregation of these networks, um, you know, kind of networks of talent, networks of entrepreneurs, networks of capital, networks of reaching customers, networks of infrastructure to support your business. Those are the things that power these kind of economic regions. And that's part of the reason why, you know, it's like, okay, let's, let's, let's try to have as many of them as possible. Like, I think actually w one good and simple way of looking at economic vitality is the economic vitality of a region. And, and obviously Silicon Valley has been big, but, you know, in, in its day with cars, you know, kind of Detroit, you know, um, uh, you know, when the, in the, uh, you know, Chicago continues to have a bunch of different strength areas, but, you know, there was, there was a period of the, the opening of the West where Chicago was the central, you know, kind of hub of what was happening in the U.S. And I think that can return in various ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the, the answer is build out those networks within your, within your region, make sure you're attracting the right kinds of uh, national and global investment talent, et cetera, and make sure the infrastructure is empowering it. And then to the earlier point that I was making, uh, tech, right, is what's accelerating this and all the future. And so you have to be playing forward on tech. Like what are the ways that we are, we are enabling that to happen? Um, and I wonder if we're thinking about the regions in the right way. You know, I think of, about mm. Chicago as being Chicago, but I lived mm. in the Midwest for a while, you know, went to college in the Midwest. A lot of the people who I was in a liberal arts school in Indiana, DePaul with, were from Chicago, the Chicago suburbs, from St. Louis, Cincinnati. And, you know, I, I see, you know, Salesforce has done a lot in Indianapolis, for example. You got P&G uh, in Cincinnati, northern Kentucky. Um, is there enough regional coordination and thinking or mm. are some regions perhaps too city focused in their approach. Um, we talk about Silicon Valley, but Silicon Valley is not San Francisco focused. San Francisco has been getting a lot more attention lately, uh, but you know, that San Jose has a big play in Palo Alto, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how would you approach that? So um, I do think it's kind of city region. 
Um, so uh, uh, usually there has to be one or more cities in the region because uh, it's it's it, I think about these things not surprising for the for the, for the guy who co-founded LinkedIn in terms of networks. I actually think those networks uh, provide both safety nets and trampolines, um, you know, for elevation uh, in this kind of structure. And I think uh, cities are the densification of networks. Uh, the same reason, like you know, companies have headquarters and other kinds of things. And so you want a strong and vibrant city network. And usually it's better when there's multiple companies, um, even better, multiple industries uh, that are doing it. One of the you know, positives on the Chicago and other kinds of circumstances. I do think you need one or more of them, not just one uh, per se. Sometimes it's, 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 it's one particular uh, city that's doing, uh, you know, kind of most of the, the anchor for an area. And I think then the question is, is to say, how do we provide the, the kind of the network parts of it. I mean, like, for example, part of what's useful about, like essential about things like the Economic Club of Chicago is 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 sharing learning, uh, sharing ability to do business together, sharing ab ability to do investments, sharing uh, perspectives on what's happening in, in, in various kinds of industry. And this is the increasing the efficacy of the network. All right, and so cities as networks is I think the key thing and multiple cities and city regions uh, as networks. Now, obviously, um, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping that we'll be taking more advantage of, uh, you know, because, you know, when you ever have a never waste a good crisis, um, you know, kind of former mayor Rahm Emanuel, you know, uh, one of the proponents of this, I think, very uh, important thing. You say, well, we had the pandemic. Uh, we're having a reset. Part of that reset allows perhaps um, more uh, kind of regional participation, people being able to work in a more distributed fashion. How do we use that to create the industry, the jobs, the products, the services of the future? Um, and so I think it's it's an important thing to kind of lean into. So tell me why cities still matter then, given that so many people are trying to push the idea that you can work from anywhere, uh, you know, Microsoft Teams, uh, LinkedIn, et cetera. You can connect to people from all over the place. There's controversy now about how much you'll be paid depending on, uh, you know, where you're working from home. But um, why won't cities be entirely upended? Why won't that densification mm -hmm. effect be uh, permanently disrupted mm -hmm. if companies, um, they don't have to leave entirely, but if they, you know, stop expanding so much and if workers are coming in less often, there's less economic impact of you know a business being located in a particular place because there's less foot traffic what what is a place that is so dense and so tall uh in, in a good way <laughs> like chicago what, what do they do to adapt to those conditions to invest in the right things perhaps to offset or accelerate the changes uh that are going to be important to business in the future so i think uh so de the network is the important thing so the densification network the network's ability to function effectively it's one of the reasons why we've uh economic progress has been cities has been companies and you say well now um, we have an ability to have that network have density with less intensity and focus on the absolute geographic focus so that's great i can you know, think a little, that'll help create various forms of productivity you know part of 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 the productivity of you know, back to Adam Smith and capitalism is, you know, diversity of this person's really good at this, this person's really good at this. One, was one is uh, much greater than two, sometimes greater than three, four, five as a way of doing it. And that that ability to spread out the network and not necessarily need to be geolocated is a huge productivity increase. That being said, there's still a bunch of things that are valuable for being co-located. Um, uh, you, there's a, the speed at which you operate. There's the building of trust and relationships as you're interacting with people. Um, yes, we've done a lot better through these virtual environments than we've ever done before in the virtual environments. But it's still a, uh, like, for example, if you look at the investing business, there's like still going to be the, well, who is the entrepreneur going to feel that they want to spend the next 10 years working with? It's the person they have trust with. Building trust is still better in person. The speed at which you operate, there's a reason why startups tend to go, okay, let's get everyone, like when you're a seed stage, series A stage, like let's get everyone in a room. Now, obviously there's uh, inventions like this, um, uh, you know, uh, in various, you know, uh, remotion, other kinds of things that are, that are, that are uh, creating kind of virtual offices so you can do this, but there's still value. Uh, to being in person. There's still value uh, to those kinds of aggregation. I think there's still value to having an office space. Uh, now, maybe it's like there was a 100x and now maybe it's 50x or 20x 
uh, for these things, or even 10 in some cases, depending on the industry, the nature of the business, the nature of the job. But I think that the, the, the network, the, the, the effectiveness of the network is still the thing that creates the amplification. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's still roles for cities, for companies, for headquarters and so forth, even as this, the network is being redefined. We're getting good audience questions, and so I want to go to a couple of those while we're on this subject. Uh, Gary Pines asks for uh, an example of success in building out these networks in, in the Midwest, if you have that example, or maybe even if you have a perspective on kind of where Boston slipped, right? They, they had all the, the pieces. I remember when I started in you know covering tech 20 plus years ago, there was a lot of talk about telecom in Boston. They should have kind of owned at least a lot more of the internet than they have. Where did they go wrong? What has worked with building out these networks in particular? Well, so I think that a lot of um, the whole question is is the participation and acceleration within uh, uh, within networks. So, like for example, uh, again, regional advantage by Annalise Sixinian kind of showed that it caused uh, harder for people to leave big companies to do stuff by having anti competes. Uh, by having campuses where all the food was like you, you basically only ate with other people from your company versus going out and, 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 and seeing people or being able to invite other people from other companies in and having that network spread was one of the things that slowed Boston down. Um, also, of course, you know, one of the things that I think, um, has, um, really, uh, that Silicon Valley has learned that I think is a good lesson for around the world. And I think other places are contributing to this too is how do you think about building your tech uh, companies and products and services as platforms? How do you make that platform happen? And now, obviously, it's not just Silicon Valley. You've got Shopify, uh, you know, kind of doing this uh, in a magnificent way, um, you know, in Toronto and in Ottawa in, in terms of, 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 of um, uh, you know, kind of a building out a platform as a way of doing that. And so having that platform-based approach where you don't say, oh, I own it entirely, but actually, in fact, I'm building ecosystems. Again, ecosystems networks where other people can invest in it and build on top of it in various ways. And that's part of the reason why, of course, the internet exploded in, in productivity. So how do you convert the, the building of technology into platforms? And I think that's the, the kind of approach and the sharing of information. Like this is like, I think, uh, Toby Lupka and 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 Shopify are a good example of the fact that actually, in fact, you can kind of do this any place where you have a good focus on technical talent and 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 some ideas and some uh, willingness to to build into it. Because more often than not, platforms have this kind of more of a kind of a classic rocket, you know, kind of um, takeoff curve, where for years they're kind of you know kind of going okay we're building we're building we're building and this, now we're starting to compound uh, and even um you know kind of uh, things like airbnb with a marketplace that's a form of a platform you know people are developers developing host experiences uh developing what their space is and i think that's the kind of thing uh to look at uh in terms of as an entrepreneur or as a region uh and then one more on this general subject uh, as I was learning about Silicon Valley living out there, um, the connection of institutions of higher learning, uh, you know, Stanford, Berkeley, et cetera, uh, San Jose State, which, you know, too often gets short shrift, uh, particularly around uh, me mechanical and some hardware stuff, to uh, large companies and then to venture capital, and then the location, all of that. Who's doing the best job at uh, pathways from higher ed into either startups or work? Are there things that uh, a city, a region like the Chicago region could do better where that's concerned? And that's kind of a modification of a question from Jeffrey Moss. Ah, so um, I think one question, which is one of the things that I think has made Stanford obviously very good at this is, is is to allow innovation, to allow experimentation. You know, Stanford allows students and faculty members to go spend a year or two going out and founding a company or doing something and doesn't say, well, if you leave, you know, you're, you know, you've left Stanford and you're out. And so that kind of allowing uh, permission allows a lot of innovation and, and path building um, as ways of doing this. And I think that's a, um, you know, a particularly good kind of local to Silicon Valley one as a way of doing it. I also think that, generally speaking, 
you know, the kind of the the dynamics where you say, well, actually, in fact, it's um, it isn't just purely, uh, you know, kind of like uh, study, but also what you build. Um, so I think there's a great set of, you know, kind of, of various forms of universities that are like, okay, we're we're, we're supportive of people going and building stuff. <laughs> um, it isn't just a, you know, play the academic game and, 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 and kind of all become a professor, um, you know, the Stanford example, but, you know, you've got various, um, you know, kind of business schools, multidisciplinary is usually a really good way of doing it. Um, so like my own background, symbolic systems at Stanford, uh, multidisciplinary tends to be the, you know, how do I solve this prom problem in front of me uh, versus how do I prove my, my my pure talent at a discipline uh, is also useful. Now that being said, I think there could be a lot done to amplify this. Um, I think that there's a lot of questions around, and you know, part of the reason, like I wrote my first book, the Startup Review, was kind of how do you provide, you know, kind of advice to people to say, look, how do I manage in this new world? And the answer is be the entrepreneur of your own career. Um, you know, don't, don't, don't think, hey, I discover what I have a passion for, and then I just kind of work on my way on the career a ladder and escalator. But to do that, and I think that's part of the kind of thing that uh, universities, um, you know, kind of, or, you know, all schools need to be helping more is to say, look, you need to be out in the network of the world, because that's where the vast majority will be. And this is how we can help you do that. And it isn't just, you know, learning to learn, which is important, obviously, in all kinds of ways, but also that, that that being out and being connected and navigating the world, I think, is useful. Mm. Uh, now, LinkedIn, uh, which you co-founded, uh, mm. just hit ten billion dollars in annual revenue, uh, and you know, talked to Ryan Roslansky uh, over there, who's now the CEO, about that milestone, the end of mm. Microsoft's uh, fiscal year. Um, you and I have talked about this a bit in the past, but re reflect, if you will, now what in that initial idea about LinkedIn were you right about that has continued hmm. to play out and influence what it is? And what were you wrong about? Uh, well, hopefully the things I'm wrong about, I'm yet to be right about, but I will answer that question too. Um, so what I was right <laughs> about was uh, we, are, we are becoming a, um, the world is becoming more and more networked, right? Obviously, we have some uh, kind of worries around populism and other kinds of things about like, oh, well, you know, maybe globalism is too networked in some ways and we need to be, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, c uh, countries and populations are feeling they need to be somewhat protected by society. And by the way, I think that protectiveness is a good thing to kind of figure out a good coherent society. I think network is still how we get prosperity. It's everything from the economic benefits of, you know the, the the last 50 years to you know even scientific benefits like uh you know creating the vaccine you know which is created you know through you know kind of the global network and i think that's an important thing now that being said so linkedin you know anticipates that says where the world is going to become more networked and and uh the right way to you know kind of approach your own economic destiny is to participate in professional networks, to have an identity, have people be able to find you, be able to find other folks, you know, be able to find uh, the best possible opportunity for you and your skill set and your aspirations and where you're where you're going um, as part of this. And I think that was all correct. Now, I think the thing that we were, um, you know, kind of like it's taken a long time to play out is things where, where would people start learning the network orientation. That you should think of yourself as in a network, um, because, for example, like one one uh, a couple of use cases in LinkedIn, which I think are really important, but I still hear very few people saying them. They were designed from this in 2003. One is, well, why do I connect to someone else on LinkedIn? I connect to them in order to help them, right? Like I am I am inviting them and connect them in that, my network where they can find other people and I could unselectively connect them, and introduce them. So like connecting them is to help them, is to be part of allies with them in this. Um, another one is to say, well, look, everyone should go fill out um, a basic profile to be able to be found because part of the network orientation is, sure, I'm searching, I'm looking, I'm looking for what the opportunity is, but being found, because there's 7 billion people out there in the world, is more important than my ability to being searched, <laughs> right? And so having that kind of network orientation. So I still think, like I thought like in 2006, 2007, people would see the network, they'd start having a network orientation. And I think we're still working on that. Um, and maybe something else in here that uh, I want your take on. 
I'm not sure that the all the incentives in LinkedIn are lined up with the way hmm. that you might intend. Like, uh, hmm. I find a lot of people want to connect to everybody who asks on LinkedIn. I'm one of those people where I kind of want to know you, have had a conversation, preferably have met in person, but to have some sense of being able to vouch for at least who you are professionally before connecting. But, you know, th there are incentives out there to just connect to everybody and get as popular as possible or to look as popular as possible. What, um, what are the right incentives for those who are looking to use LinkedIn in the right way and for those who are looking to perhaps structure their networks the best? Well, John, I use LinkedIn the way you do, uh, which is I only connect to people that I know well enough to, to, to introduce to someone else in my network on a knowledgeable basis. Like I may have been like, hey, I talked to them for an hour at a conference and they seem really interesting about this, this, and this, and, and you know, is therefore valuable to connect to you. And that's what I recommend to everybody. Now, that being said, we allow the freedom of doing it the way that you want. This actually back to the mistake thing. When we launched LinkedIn, we put your kind of number of connections going up to an, to to whatever number it is, and that caused some people to say, "I'm going to have thirty thousand connections," and you're like, "Oh God, nobody has like thirty thousand people that they know <laughs> enough to say, hey, uh, this is John. He's really smart. Um, he knows about these topics. <laughs> you know, he'd be useful uh, for you to talk to. Here, I'm providing the introduction, um, and so we then uh, fix that to a five hundred plus cap." Um, as the, to try to change those incentives. Uh, and part of the incentive is to say, well, actually, in fact, if you're connecting where people say, hey, yeah, I can introduce you to so-and-so, then there's a natural kind of economic incentive when people start using it on a network basis to be the, hey, I'm, I'm connected with people that I know well enough to refer to other people. Um, we still hope for that, um, but, you know, we can't, you know, we allow people individual freedom in, in, in what their level of what, level do I know them enough? And obviously there are people out there who are like, well, I heard their name and that knows them well enough. And I'm like, okay, that's for you, <laughs> not, not for me. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Now we got a number of questions along these lines about um, startup and investment selection. Uh, so I'm gonna try to wrap a few of them together, but um, what is it that you look for or prioritize when you're talking to entrepreneurs and maybe looking at a pitch deck and deciding what to invest in. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk of getting away from pattern matching and not looking for, you know, a Mark Zuckerberg clone in a hoodie uh, who dropped out of Harvard or, or whatever. But what do you emphasize when it comes to either track record of the entrepreneur, quality of the mm -hmm. idea, any demonstrated yep. uh, persistence or anything like that? So um, the classic things are obviously a market, uh, a plan uh, with that market, including how you play out against competition and the, the, the founders, the entrepreneurs themselves. And, you know, the one early mistake in investing is to blend the three scores. And what you really want is one of those, at least preferably all three, to be well above the bar saying, yes, this is worth taking this bet on. Now, the most central one almost always is the founders uh, themselves because, um, you know, she or he um, could, you know, kind of be the, okay, I don't know what my exact product market fit. I'm going to have to do a lot of, of adjusting and pivoting in order to get there, especially in the earliest stages. And that bet on the person being able to, you know, go through this, what I call the infinite learning curve that the changes in the business are are essentially really critical. So uh, the, uh, the the founders are really key. And, and ideally, uh, I try to reference uh, Czech founders even before I meet them. So like, for example, when I met uh, Brian, Joe, and Nate, uh, the founders of Airbnb the very first time, I'd already reference checked them. So three minutes into the investment, I, I said, look, I'm gonna make you an offer, uh, a pitch. Uh, I'm gonna make you an offer to invest uh, because you know, you've got the right, vision of this huge market and the kind of how you're going to navigate through it. Now, that being said, what did, uh, um, some, what did you ask? What did you ask in that reference check that made you so confident? Well, the kinds of things that you're looking for are um, what is the learning, uh, learning speed and learning curve? Um, what are the unique kind of skills and assets that they uh, bring to bear? Because by the way, some, some skills are more important than others on the early stage entrepreneurship side, although the general learning, um, 
orientation and fast learning is 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 kind of really key. Uh, one of the things that was interesting in the Airbnb case is, you know, typically kind of pattern matching tends to be, uh, were you coding intensively before you were 12 um, is a useful kind of a tech indicator. Um, but, 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 and, and it was true of Nate, but, but like with Brian and Joe, design was the key thing. And actually, in fact, when you're looking at the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve, you go, oh, actually design is the right thing here. Because not only were they thinking design of the website, they were thinking design of the experience, design of what the, 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 how, you know, not just how do you find this really interesting property, but like when you get there and your experience of spending the night there and your experience of belonging to the local community into the city and that approaching that with a design mindset was like, oh yeah, that's, that's going to be dispositive and super interesting. And that was the kind of thing that led them to, well, maybe what we should do is really focus on making sure the photography is good. And that means we'll go do the initial photography, talking to the host, learning, learning mindset as a way of doing it. And so having gotten all of that color and character before even getting into the meeting meant that, you know, cause sometimes you say, well, I didn't get it all. And so I can't make the offer in the first meeting. I have to, even if I get really excited, I have to go do some referencing because uh, referencing is super important, networked world, right? We all, we all can find good references. And so uh, those are the kinds of things um, for the, for, for entrepreneurs. And it can be a whole range of things. It's like a good fit for like, there's relatively few entrepreneurs who are like, for anything, it's for this amazing race, right? Like if you said, if I came forward and said, hey, I've got an idea for a fusion reactor, you know, uh, he's like, well, okay, who are your technical co-founders and are the other people know how to do this, <laughs> right? Uh, would be the, you know, whereas on network software, I would be the kind of right, uh, you know, founder, co-founder anyway. Huh, so how, if at all, does that calculation or that process change when you're talking about uh, founders from underrepresented demographics? You know, for for um, reasons that I don't know would take us another hour to get into, um, women are less likely to have been encouraged, perhaps, to code before age 12. Um, you know, and people from underrepresented minorities might not have the same number of references who you would know for you to check. So um, do, do you still need to follow the same pattern to maintain your investment quality? And it's just that smaller percentage of those groups who are represented in your ability to check their references get through? Or do you have to alter the way you check and filter? Well, one of the good things about, and I'm, this is not a, obviously a, a sales point for LinkedIn, but it's now possible to do reference checking on anyone, right? Because you can find other people who know them. And so I think the uh, you keep reference checking, but where you build your networks and where you look and what kinds of things you look for could change. Um, Greylock, we've been doing a tremendous amount. Uh, we're working with management leaders tomorrow. Uh, we're working with various uh, early stage um, venture firms, uh, 645 Ventures and else to build out the network, to have networks of underrepresented uh, minorities uh, be able to uh, pitch us to be able to participate in our ecosystems and and events and 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 kind of co uh, company development um, as a way of doing that. And we've had you know kind of great success in in funding more, uh, especially women entrepreneurs in the last uh, year uh, in doing this. And so uh, there, I think there's been a um, there, it's it's always a network build uh, for making it happen. Now the it, the point you make is like for example, this is one of the reasons the knots. Um, you know, kind of blindly follow earlier patterns of saying, well, um, you know, for decades, uh, basically only men would be coding or mostly only men would be coding much fewer women by percentage. That's changing. Uh, there's now uh, a huge number of women who are, you know, kind of uh, CS majors, uh, you know, that that process itself uh, is changing. And, and, and I think that's going to be great uh, for the industry, for uh, creation of great products and services and jobs in the future. Uh, but, but you, you know, the time is now to accelerate that network build. And so part of what, you know, we're doing at Greylock is to make sure that the networks are built that way um, so that uh, the paths for uh, women, um, uh, entrepreneurs of color, other folks can actually, in fact, uh, get their companies uh, financed and built. Um, yeah, that that's, Valuable. And uh, I want to ask now about uh, another aspect of 
networking of LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn has LinkedIn Learning uh, and being able to learn remotely, whether you're at a professional level and you need certification and you're going through either something like LinkedIn Learning or Coursera, et cetera, uh, that's been important. We've seen these moves by uh, Guild Education with Walmart and Target and others lately to advanced learning. Let's stick to what you've seen on LinkedIn with engagement mm -hmm. with learning and the ability to scale up there. Are there takeaways that are un unexplored or underexplored that we should be thinking about for K-12 education and how technology can be used mm -hmm. to um, kind of close gaps and accelerate learning for all? And th this is an adaptation of, of Chris Broughton's question uh, that mm -hmm. came through. So I think we're literally just at the earliest stages. I think one of the potential ways to use the pandemic uh, crisis is this kind of opening up of allowing more and diverse education, more education using technology, more education through these tools. Now, obviously, there's a digital divide of people who have access to uh, computers and 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 fast internet streams and everything else, and that's an important thing to continue to get right. But as you as you as you as you build it, um, and as it's there, now there's a lot more willingness to experiment with the demand, a lot more willingness to say, okay, that's an acceptable alternative path. And I think um, we are literally at the earliest stages. So like, you know, LinkedIn um, is is obviously focused on a bunch of things that kind of professionals. Uh, might use anything from, you know, management to negotiation to, you know, kind of uh, sales to project management and others. I have a couple of 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 of, of classes on LinkedIn myself, um, you know, on uh, the book The Alliance for how to do kind of modern managing of entrepreneurial talent and and other ways of doing this. And to some degree, those early patterns, like the, the real thing is it's it's kind of like you're in your your like if you want to use a baseball analogy, it isn't it isn't just you're at the first inning, you're kind of at the first of a second pitch, right? For it, because um there's so much to do here in terms of making it happen. Now, for the K-12 part of your question, I think part of this is to say, well, what are the ways we can now adjust to having a whole set of resources, you know, things like, like what are the learnings from the Khan Academy? What are the learnings from this stuff? And what are the ways that we can make that a maximally work? Now, one of the, the challenges I think for the pandemic for student education is a lot of what keeps students energized is the students around them. And so I think, you know, we're gonna have something of a, like we're still really working on this and we're gonna have something of a, of a pickup that we're going to need to do because some students go without the energy of the students around me, I just not paying attention to the screen. I'm just not, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, mm -hmm. you know, how do we get to that kind of learning? There's, there's a ton of work to still do. I want to ask you about Microsoft. Um, mm -hmm. When I was coming up uh, career wise in Silicon Valley, uh, mm -hmm. early two thousands, a lot of people, uh, you know, early on were writing Microsoft off after, mm -hmm. you know, the Zune and, Pocket PC and any number of those things. You um, were part of that group that was seen as running circles around Microsoft. And some people were still surprised when you sold LinkedIn to Microsoft. But now, uh, you know, people like to declare anything dead. The PC is dead, Microsoft is dead, blah, blah, blah. Clearly, Microsoft was not dead. And I think uh, Satya Nadella. Uh, was able to reinvigorate some things there and shift mindset a lot more quickly uh, than a lot of people thought. What's your take on what was wrong with Microsoft to the extent that there were things wrong, and there were, um, and what it took to awaken the things that were right uh, and kind of reset that trajectory? And, and I'm sure there are things that lots of other businesses and leaders can learn from that. Yeah, and 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 you know, we tend to tell the heroic story. I mean, Satya as a amazing leader, which he is, um, and and his book Reset, which I would I would I would highly recommend. Um, the 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 thing that is really important is to realize that curiosity, growth psychology, uh, to borrow uh, from the, the the kind of the growth mindset that Satya brought in as part of kind of the leadership of it, um, is key to this kind of reinvention, this kind of, uh, of, of, of rebirth and rebuilding. 
and it's doable, right? Because there, there just, there were just, there's just an amazing amount of talent at Microsoft that was hungry for it, hungry for. We don't want to be, you know, have everyone saying we're dead. We don't want everyone, you know, kind of like all kind of saying, hey, you guys, you guys were great, but that was then. This is now. We want to be uh, building the future. And so when you have a path for doing that, you naturally get a whole bunch of the the talent flocking to it within a within a company. So it's the importance of leadership. But like one of the expressions that I have for my first book, The Startup of You, is I to the we. It's both I and we. And so you're doing it together. And that's, I think, part of the, in addition to that kind of curiosity mindset, but like Satya is a, is a we are doing this together kind of leader. And I think that's, that's very important for those kinds of, of, of reinventions, rebirths. Um, and I think it's doable. Um, now, it helps when you have kind of an amazing set of technology, an amazing set of talent, you know, these enduring franchises and windows and office and, and other kinds of things that give you the, the range to do it. It has the, the, the margin to go play, but it's that focus on what is like work towards the future, build towards the future, um, and then how to do that. I and mean, I think that's the, the most fundamental part of the, the growth mindset. Uh, I also continue to think it's interesting, <clears throat> his um, manner, his sensibility, his approach is different from the typical kind of tech CEO approach. And he's got this anecdote uh, in his book, which we've talked about, where, you know, the board, when they asked him uh, if he wanted to be CEO, he said, well, if you want me to be. And some people thought initially, well, that's the wrong answer. You're supposed to be gung-ho, you know, football coach, absolutely, I'm the only guy. Um, but he wasn't like that. Uh, but he's still, uh, even perhaps because of that, been effective. Uh, there's a, a question from the group that I think is important about uh, the role of corporate America in mm. society and civic engagement. Right now, it seems that uh, companies are often trusted a lot more than governments, than media, et cetera, and expected to take political stances, social stances. Um, maybe that's more necessary now than it's been in the past. What do you see as the role of companies, of innovators, of leaders in um, setting a tone, pushing for change, uh, civic engagement? So I think the uh companies being uh, important leaders in the society is actually a long American tradition. Um, everything from coming together and inventing uh, high schools, you know, uh, you know, kind of free public high schools as a way of, of doing this. And I think this is a important thing for, uh, and I think it's, we're getting a great uh, kind of uh, recommitment to that uh, in climate and other things, um, in, 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 in racial justice, even in, in voting systems. Like I say, look, every, we should live in a country where everyone who is allowed to vote, um, who has a right to vote, should be, make it easy for them to vote. And I think all of that is super important. And I think it's, it's the right kind of thing for leaders to be saying, you know, part of American society is, uh, we aren't just, oh, look, my only thing is providing jobs and product and services, but I'm also a leader within the society and I need to be doing things to contribute to that. Uh, and I think it's, um, you know, frequently in these very large problems, um, you know, you've got, um, you know, kind of uh, race economic justice or criminal justice, you've got climate change, you've got, um, you know, voting, as I was mentioning, other kinds of things. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. You can't say, oh, that's someone else's problem. These are system problems. These are problems that go across it. And I think it's one of the things that I think is that is happening across all of the well-led companies that the CEOs are saying, hey, here are the topics that align with our culture, our mission, our value system, and we are going to step forward and also be contributing to the health and growth of society. And you know, you can see it anything from, you know, what the tech companies are doing saying, okay, climate change and what are we doing about trying to green the energy grid and and or rural connectivity and create that as part of it or um, you know, kind of um, you know, any number of other companies that are doing this and it's been it's been a delight and an honor to see and participate in. All right, all right. Now, as we begin to draw to a close, um, tell me, and this is also off of uh, an economic club question, what's the most notable, you think, an enduring change, either in economic conditions or in consumer behavior 
that you've seen over the last 18 months that appears durable and hmm. that uh, you know economic leaders, companies, entrepreneurs should take note of in order to accelerate and scale their businesses? Well, I think the most central one is one we already kind of referred to, and I think everyone sees is that now there's an ability to harness a much wider network, right? You can hire a much wider network of talent. You can hire people who could be working remotely and could contribute to, for example, the technological um, growth and uh, iteration of your industry. Um, I think that larger network also finds customers and finds expertise and finds capital. And I think that uh, that part of it and the set of tools for accelerating it. Now, the more subtle part of that is also uh, industries which, which were previously locked in by this kind of their, their old ecosystem, uh, medicine, education. Like I think now people are gonna see telemedicine in much more interesting ways because they say, well, actually the very first thing I'd like to do is I've, I've got like this thing and I'd like, oh, I wanna check this out and I can go check it out right now in telemedicine and know whether or not I should go into the clinic and so forth. And I think all of that will happen as well and that will allow the continuing software transformation of things, you know, cell phones that could do quick diagnostics and then of course help um, the emerging markets uh, in the world as well and bring medicine there. And so I think that uh, broadening of the network, that that densification, more nodes, um, uh, the network expansion is I think the kind of thing that's gonna empower all kinds of, of, of individual use cases and productivity. And so what's the point of caution then, because you can mm. always take these things too far. You mm. did point out that even though it's possible to do so many things remotely, there's still value in having a physical location. So with that potential of accessing a broader network, is there a point of caution? I'd say the principal point of caution is that earliest point that I made, which is a tale of two worlds. It's very easy for one group to benefit a whole lot and then the other group to get, you know, kind of be left more behind. And actually, in fact, that leads to to unhappiness and suffering and disorder in societies and so forth. And I think it's in all of our interest to say, no, no, not a tale of a new network group and a tale of an unnetwork group. It's how do you how do you continue to make sure that you're bringing uh, everyone along on the journey? Yeah, and that's so important in cities and regions, particularly because you know the problems become local and they open up when uh, all the stakeholders don't have enough of a say and a seat at the table. Reed, uh, it's been a great conversation. I appreciate uh, all of the insights. And now uh, I'd like to bring in David Snyder uh, to kind of close things up. Great. Thank you, John. John uh, and Reed, just an outstanding conversation. And on behalf of the club and our members, I just want to thank you so much for joining us this afternoon.